this talk, uh, also sponsored by the Northwest Database Society. Today we are very happy to have Jenny Ahmad with us. She's an assistant professor at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, she actually has a PhD from Brown University and also did a postdoc at uh, Cornell. Uh, and in his past has worked on string processing, model-based databases, but today we're going to hear about uh, DMSS. Fantastic, thank you very much uh, for having me here. It's a great pleasure to be back in Seattle. Um, so uh, the work that I'm going to talk about today is this DBTOSA project that we started actually while Cornell was sort of continuing. And my collaborators on this are Oliver Kennedy and Christoph Koch. So the work here uh, is motivated by applications that need to handle large dynamic data sets. And these kinds of applications and the dynamic computing model is becoming a lot more common for a variety of reasons in, in today's applications. Um, a couple of these reasons include generating data has never been easier. When we consider the amount of computing uh, devices and power that we have, in addition to uh, the technical acumen that businesses, enterprises, and scientists are developing. Now, these applications are often long running, and uh, they're processing these dynamic and evolving data sets. And this is sort of becoming more apparent as a lot of computing uh, services move to the cloud. And these are now large, massively multi-user systems where there's always some kind of user doing some work or some processing there. Now, there's a, a large variety of examples here. I'm just going to uh, briefly walk you through some. Obviously, things like electronic markets, whether it's algorithmic trading or even advertising and doing auctions for uh, determining which ad to display on a, a data stream. Um, in addition, we have things like log analysis, but also one class of applications is this database monitoring application where you need to do operation analytics and say, perhaps keep track of some kind of statistics over uh, say an OLTP workload uh, as, as the users are, uh, as transactions are coming in. And so this also applies to things like infrastructure uh, analysis and sort of large scale debugging and so forth. Now, the work here posits the databases are sort of poor at doing long lived processing of dynamic data. They really focus on short lived queries um, and essentially defer updates and do all their work at query time. And so we want to think about how we can deal with these sort of long lived uh, 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 queries and essentially think about how we can do uh, work at update time rather than just a query time to revisit this bias in between them. So let me uh, just give you a very brief example of, uh, uh, of a kind of application that we have. And uh, there's actually a, a, a range of applications in terms of how dynamic they are, how large they are. This particular application tends to be more on the dynamic side rather than having a huge data set. So this is a high frequency uh, order book trading um, where order books, if you're not familiar, capture the market microstructure uh, in an electronic exchange. It's a pretty simple idea. You essentially have a list of all the, oops, <laughs> all the buyers in the market uh, and all the sellers in the market. Uh, and the orders that they're placing. And then the electronic exchange will essentially do matching between um, the uh, a bid order and a, a sell order. So the kinds of operations you have, oops, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> this uh, thing is inverted. The kind of operations that you have um, are that you will have orders being deleted uh, or inserted and updated at, in an arbitrary fashion. So um, it turns out that, okay, how might you actually implement this? You use something like a stream processing on a, or an OLTP system. Uh, and it turns out both of those systems are not sort of really suitable for this. In this kind of application, uh, streams are not useful in the sense that we have really a completely arbitrary pattern of, of uh, changes for this. It's not that you have windows uh, where you have a contiguous set of changes. And also in this case, I mean, what's a query that you might pose on it? Well, one kind of query is that um, you want to compute something like the total volume and find the threshold. Say these are the orders above some uh, fraction of the total volume and do some analysis there to determine a strategy. Well, OLTP systems aren't really good for doing analysis queries. They rely on only accessing a few rows. When you start to access more rows, you essentially end up doing all your work serially. Okay, um, so what are some of the characteristics of these kinds of applications? First, I want to claim is that there are these sort of long-lived analysis queries. And by long-lived, I don't necessarily mean continuous in the streaming sense. I mean they're repetitive as well, right? They still might be pool-based, but occur very frequently. So the access to the data is primarily by monitoring views and doing simple computations on them. The data store sort of never really access directly. The other interesting thing I think is that a lot of these queries are machine generated. And the sort of major uh, source of database queries is through strings going through JDBC drivers and so forth. And so in this case, the workloads are not really completely ad hoc and completely arbitrary. Um, we actually kind of have a fairly decent sense of what kinds of queries we want to pose. Um, 
And the, there's a couple of other things that are interesting. The updates are almost always queried instantly. Um, and there's typically no feedback loop. And the last point means that view update isn't so much of a concern. It's, uh, what I mean there is that they typically exist, they're compiled into programs, they're embedded into Java code uh, and going through the, rather than being sort of typed in on the command line in, in an interactive fashion, okay? It might be parameterized, but you have some idea of the query structure uh, ahead. There are certain things you cannot express in database systems, like for example, in this case, you'd actually wanna send a message that says, here's the order I want to place, and there's sort of no way of doing good messaging out of database systems, or there's general functionality that you certainly cannot put into a database system. Okay. Okay, um, so what are today's sort of approaches to this? And I just want to give a very high level figure that covers some of the work that's going on. Uh, this figure has on the x-axis, um, oops, uh, data ingestion frequency, which is how frequently is this data coming, versus roughly what is the size of the working set of that database. And in recent work, we've sort of seen two uh, uh, broad topics of work. The first is looking how to scale out on data set size. And this has really been driven by a lot of work in the uh, big analytics and big data community. And so we're going to look at that's this part of the space over here. The other aspect of, uh, of this is really scaling up on data set evolution, where we have things like I mentioned, stream engines and so forth. Now, let's look at you know, actual applications themselves, right? So um, I have uh, three broad classes, algorithmic trading, um, scientific data, and web indexing. And if you actually look at what's going on, I mean, let's just take web index and it's classical motivation for a system like MapReduce, which would be up here. Recently, they introduced uh, an incremental indexing called Happy, which actually ends up being much more down in this space. So the point is, these large data sets and these applications actually need to operate on both aspects of the space. Um, you can certainly benefit from fine-grained updates when you're doing large analysis, and you can actually end up having to deal with large state um, when you're doing uh, uh, dealing with very dynamic data. The distinction is ne not necessarily as clear. And ideally, what we want to do is um, actually end up, you know, have a, a sort of flexible architecture that can sort of sp span the space. I mean, I, and the goal, real scientific goal, I guess, is to try and end up dealing with very large data sets very quickly, but that, that's a hard challenge. We're limited by resources there. Okay. So what are we going to talk about? Well, I'm going to talk about the DBTASA project, where we're starting off in this part of the space, really dealing with uh, very high frequency, but for now, main memory bounded uh, data sets. And we're going to use this as an a example of a dynamic data management system that we're building. There's sort of two aspects that we really consider. One is this notion of how to do incremental data management, um, and the other is sort of notion of compilation and, and synthesizing and generating these very small lightweight applications um, that you see a lot of people building when they don't find a system that suits their needs. Um, so in this talk, what I'm going to focus mainly on is the incremental data management part. And in particular, there's sort of going to be one technical nugget that I'm going to give you, and then we're going to sort of build up around that. And the idea here is that this technical nugget, we're going to try and discover some deep properties of queries and exploit them for scalability. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what does it mean if you start with an incremental core? What does it mean to build a system around that? Okay, fantastic. So the sort of most relevant sort of model for dynamic computing seems to be that of incremental view minutes. And I'm sure all of you know what uh, views are, so I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to briefly review is how, at a high level, does incremental view maintenance itself work? And the mechanism that's at use here are delta queries. So given a view definition query, what uh, most database systems do is that they transform this into saying, let's consider updates to a particular relation, and then given some updates to that, we're going to use a, a delta query to compute the new uh, result of, of the query that we want. Okay? Um, and so this is done by a standard rewrite. Um, and so what this delta query does is whenever you get a tuple in, you're going to go and say, in this case, go and scan that table, do the join, and push it through the aggregation. Um, the point I want to make here is that delta queries are just standard queries, like any other queries, and they're processed from scratch in uh, classical database systems. They're, in fact, parameterized queries, and we'll see that in a second. So um, the core observation to make here is that these delta queries are just regular queries. And so we actually applied, in view maintenance, what we did was we took a view definition query, applied this transformation to get to a delta query. But there's absolutely no reason to stop there, right? We can actually sort of repeat that transformation in recursive fashion, getting these higher level deltas, and that's sort of uh, the uh, nutshell of these agile views. 
And so our proposal is to use these uh, uh, high level deltas to do as incremental as possible career evaluation. We want to materialize them, we use them, and so forth. And we're actually going to take uh, the approach where these views really are more like data structures that you can embed directly in applications. And use, so coming back to some of the things that you were saying is, uh, if you look at uh, standard approaches to query embedding with embedded DSLs like Microsoft Link, they just pass all the work back to the database. What we kind of want to do is actually synthesize the database and push it directly to applications, kind of doing the reverse. So our contributions here are, um, are a recursive delta compilation algorithm that yields this fully incremental query processor. And there's a couple of key properties here. I mean, what we find is that given a, a, a delta query at level K, um, it has a lower degree, and a degree is sort of a measure of, of uh, the complexity of the query, um, than a K, uh, K minus one level delta. And that's important because it guarantees determination. Um, and uh, what we'll say is that the materializations that we're doing are done as these map simple associative uh, data structures in memory. All right. So let's uh, go through this in a little more detail. Um, First, we're going to start with delta queries. The kind of workloads that we're really considering here are some aggregate queries, group wise as well. We do have ideas of how to do other aggregations, but we can take that offline. Um, so let's, uh, what does the delta query look like? Well, it turns out that it really is just a simple parameterized SQL query. And so let's consider this example here, where we're saying, given uh, two relations R and S with the following attributes, um, let's apply a simple group by join aggregate there. Okay, uh, and let's suppose we want this to be maintained in some uh, data structure, which is ignore the double, two sets of double brackets, but just think of that as a map data structure. So whenever you want to answer a query, you say for a particular value of C, what is this aggregate value that you have here? Okay, you can do a lookup map of that data structure. The delta query for that turns out to be something like this. Um, we say, so what can change here? The relations that can change are R and S. So let's say S changes. Let's suppose that S gets a new tuple, D and E, and we'll make these parameters denoted by this at symbol in front, okay? So by a series of transformations, what will happen, and we'll go through an example in a second, I just want to show you roughly the high-level structure here, is that we end up with another query down here that has a bunch of parameters corresponding to that uh, new input. And what you notice is that um, I've circled this thing in, in orange here, and that's sort of the delta query that comes out of applying the delta transform to this high level one. Okay, and the actual transform itself, uh, sort of apply, taking a delta of a query is a fairly sort of standard one that we can use uh, from existing incremental view maintenance. There are a couple of issue, uh, things that we've done to that uh, in terms of dealing with nested queries, and I'll come back to that later. Um, so if you look at the outside here, it, we could absolutely just push that in here. But the only thing, the point is that this parameter E here is not used anywhere here. So actually, we don't really need to care about this query is independent of E, and that's a simplification. When we're doing a lookup in our map, we don't really need to do that. We don't need to have the parameter E as an E parameter. Right. So okay, that's a good point. So let me sort of uh, uh, distinguish two things. So why are there two levels of, of brackets here? Um, the first is. Uh, this is sort of uh, fairly similar to data log and bound and free variables in data log if you're familiar with them. Um, first, there are uh, output parameters, which would be C in this case. And this is essentially a, an attribute that comes from, uh, is defined by within the query. In fact, C comes from the relation R here. Yeah? D is a free uh, variable in this. It's, it's not bound in this um, query here. It's a pure parameter, and you need to actually give it a value for this query to be safe and well-defined. Okay? Otherwise, you can't evaluate that query. So we're just separating those two values out of that. No. <laughs> this is just, this is a delta. This is a, an example of a transformation from a query to a delta query, the first level. Okay? So you define your view like this, and you'll come up with a delta. And the next slide will make it a little clearer um, what's going on. Let's not work on this example. Let's, uh, we'll see it in, in two slides, okay? Right. So um, I want to give you a high-level point of what we're doing, right? Um, what we're doing is we're generating with these, uh, this uh, sort of recursive query compilation these incremental trigger programs. And in, in essence, we have a sort of internal calculus, internal representation that can do things like compose parameterized queries and define triggers and so on. But essentially what a trigger is is a sequence of statements. So whenever you insert onto the order relation, you're going to essentially do a bunch of simple uh, updates onto these various data structures 
And these are going to be sort of expressions that we'll look at in a little more detail in one second. So we'll take a query and generate a program like this. And you can imagine this program is pretty easy to l translate down into a low-level language like C or C++. OK, so let me give you a, a sense of the high-level picture of what's going on. Given a view definition query, OK, the first thing we're going to do is take a delta of that query, because if we can materialize this as a, a map, MQ, then we can maintain it with this delta query. Okay? And that's standard in incremental view maintenance. This delta query has some parameters, so it's not just, you know, it's not a simple uh, pure SQL query. It has, it's a parameterized SQL query, and we have to deal with these parameters in this interesting way, and it requires some manipulation. What we want to do is this, so we are maintaining a map with a delta query. Now, every time you get a change onto the orders relation, you evaluate that statement from scratch. Okay? Yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm just simplifying, moving them for simplicity. We'll come back to a, a more detailed example. Yeah, they exist. They exist. They exist. Absolutely. Uh, yes, they are. <laughs> and uh, we'll, I'll go through the example in, in precise detail. This is just to be a high-level view of what's going on. Okay? The point I want to make here is that, again, we're going to just materialize this delta query here, and then we can maintain it by taking a, sort of a delta of a delta. OK? I will explain it in about 10 slides. But it's, it's not quite. We have a, a, a form, an internal form. Um, and so I mentioned this degree of a query. And the degree of a query gets less and less. And that's essentially what determines when something uh, terminates. OK. So these uh, data structures are the maps that you see that are maintained in trigger. And at some point, you'll see that the deltas that we have are independent of the database, OK? And that's when we'll terminate when there's sort of no data that it depends on that's in the database. But it's this sort of recursive structure that we go through. So this is just a high level. So let's now really go through an example, OK? <laughs> um, yeah. 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 They. So they stop right here, OK? Um, so what this means is that every time you get an update, you're going to be doing this query processing entirely from scratch. Yep, it will just be. And whereas in this case, you're going to get a lot more reuse. So if you, if you think about um, what approaches people might take, yes, there's views here. There's also caching going on, right? But let's take the example of caching. I mean, all of this is sort of opportunistic. This is a very precise, uh, precise codified way of saying, how am I going to reuse the work that I've already done? How am I going to be incremental? Yeah? And uh, you can be incremental with this query here. And with more complex queries, you can be incremental further and further down. And essentially, do, do uh, ex the minimum amount of work you need to do for delta to maintain the result. OK. Now, we're going to go through it in, in, in proper detail. OK? So we start with this query. It's a two-way joint query. Um, and let's suppose that we want the signature of the, of the result that we're going to ask for is this map. has ORD key and S prior, as you mentioned. Yeah? Um, so anytime we want to know the result of the query, we just do a lookup on this map here. OK, so what can change in this query? Well, there's two things, right? The line item and orders, fairly straightforward. So whenever a line item changes, we're going to apply a uh, use the delta query with respect to the line item. Whenever order changes, we're going to use the delta query with respect to that. So that's going to be the top level of the program. But let's only go down one path first. Let's consider um, line the what happens when the line item changes. Yeah. So uh, here in this uh, map, the data are used where the data were not the map that was the key as prior that you the data that the I'll come to that in a second. In this case, it will actually return multiple entries. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and the, here's one way of figuring out why, right? Look at this. This map has S prior as, an, as a result. So you want to be able to query by S prior. Um, there's no value of S prior in this update. So we, we're going to need to maintain multiple values of S prior here. And I'll, I'll make this a little more clear in a second. OK. So we started with a, 
the, on, the, on the insertion line item, we have these two parameters, OK and ET. What we're going to do is the first sort of step of transformation and simplification is going to say, we no longer have this entire line item relation, right? We only have this single tuple that we're dealing with. Why don't we just substitute um, this uh, uh, line item relation with this tuple, OK? So I'm going to use a syntax value, which is Postgres syntax for a single tuple relation. Um, and what I can do now is really what, what this substitution lets us do, it lets us treat these parameters as constants. And you can simplify, push these constants around and simplify this query out. So what you're going to get here is, OK, where does um, order key appear here? Order key appears here, so I can replace in the where clause with that parameter. EP appears um, up here in sum out text price, so I can actually replace it with sum of a constant, and sum of constant is the same as a constant times one, yeah? Sum one, okay? So once we push these pr uh, parameters around, we're going to end up with this slightly simpler query, and note that you can pull EP out here, as you mentioned here, it's just EP times the, the count, someone's count over the orders. And um, we're going to create a map out of this. We're going to materialize this uh, delta query. And this delta query, uh, and the map that comes from this delta query is going to have two parameters, OK, order key and prior. But in this case, order key is fixed. It comes from the input that you computed here. So let's look at what the, this is the query version. Let's look at what the statement looks like. The statement looks like that. So to maintain map m, we're going to use the constant value of EP and do a, a, a lookup into the map ML. And this ML is the materialization of delta L. Now, as you mentioned, um, S prior sort of doesn't exist anywhere, right? It's not part of the input. It really is part of this output map. So what this statement corresponds to, it means that loop over this map, and for every entry in that map, apply this uh, computation. So let me explain that a little more. For every entry S prior in ML, uh, assign this value according to that statement. I'm just going to use this, the simpler syntax just to, uh, and it's always, it's actually always clear when you have loops based on what's defined in the uh, parameters versus what variable you need. Okay? Okay, so that was the process for one level of compilation. Okay. Sure. We wanted uh, an algorithmic way of doing the simplification, right? Um, it's, it's not clear that you can actually go, I, I'm not sure what you mean by go directly to the data structures, but you need to transform and simplify because, um, and what will become clear later on is that this simplification is non-trivial in any, in any shape or form. It's actually an MP. Um, that was a very straightforward example. Uh, what, so what this really depends on um, is the join graph that's underneath this uh, uh, data. So what we're kind of doing in some sense is when you take a delta, you say one edge of this join graph is going to become a delta. And so that essentially lets you separate out this join graph, or if it's, you know, if that's sort of a, a, a cutting edge, or it will keep it together. There'll be some subgraph that comes up. And that subgraph can be factorized and optimized in different ways, which means that this uh, rewrite process is non-trivial. You cannot directly grab a data structure out of that. There's, a, there's many ways of creating data structures out of the graph once you've taken the delta, and it's not always just a one-to-one -one, uh, uh, data structure that corresponds to that graph. It's an optimization problem. And I, I'll, I'll try and explain some of that uh, in a second. So, so you, you told me more about uh, the delta for size uh, 18 and, and Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we, we have this uh, translation problem that you mentioned here, right? So this is where you get a copy of the data. Yeah. Uh, so is that a specific one that's really different in scope, or is it just that? So, right. So, I mean, they have, they have a bunch of work on incremental. I mean, it's, I mean, so what I don't think they've done, they haven't considered this sort of recursive of, of applying a delta to a delta, from what I understand. Right. So, why, once you apply a delta to a query, then you can basically write something with a query and uh, on the query. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, uh, uh, the, the, the process of taking a delta 
it's just a standard incremental view maintenance. Uh, applying a delta of a query is a standard technique, except for one case, which I'll show later on, which is to do with nested queries. Okay? Things get a lot more complicated. Um, now, yeah, so, so the, the, the contribution that we're claiming is, is really this recursive approach that lets you transform to essentially these very simple data structure manipulations to do this. And this is sort of a different way, I think, of, of query plans than sort of your operator-based models and so on. I really want to make this notion of, of a simple data structure manipulation language that you can evaluate queries with increments. Okay? Right. So, um, good question. So, uh, where we, this is where we're at, right? We've actually only considered uh, the delta on L, um, and we came up with a single statement. Okay, um, now we have to do that recursively. And I'm going to sort of you know, go through this a little bit quickly now, just uh, do this. But so what is the second level? So the query that came out of this first level was this ML query. And if you remember, this was the delta of L. And I've, I've kept the query up here, right? So this is a query with some parameters. Or here is a parameter, but it's applied over the order relation. So now... What we did was we took a data structure map and we uh, are maintaining it by another map, but now we need to figure out how to maintain this map and the changes that it can, it can see. Okay? And so that's what this second level is going to do here. We're going to maintain the map ML as the order relation changes um, by computing the order query. And I'm not going to walk through all the details, but the process is essentially the same. As you mentioned, it's just applying a delta to a query. Right? So again, we'll apply the same process of taking the orders relations as, as constants, pushing that around and manipulating it and coming up with a very simple query. This query, in this example, we terminate here, yeah, because this query does not depend on any relation in the database. It's only got parameters. This is an if condition. If ord key equals OK, then that value otherwise is zero, right? OK. So in this case, we just... Uh, actually end up incrementing the value of ML by one. And at that point, we've sort of terminated this branch of recursive compilation. Oops. Now, um, what I'm not going to show is that there was obviously another branch. So here we started with L as level one. And then we went to O as level two. There's another branch. We started with O as level one and goes to L as level two. Now, I'm not going to show that, but um, we'll see the final program at the end of the day. Let's, uh, Sort of move forward. So you asked the question, so how does this terminate? Why does this terminate? Um, it turns out that we can define a, a, a measure, degree, the degree of a query, um, roughly based on high level rules. I don't need to go through them. But the key point is that as part of our transformation, for every delta that we're taking, we ensure that the degree is reduced by one. Okay? Um, you can think of it as taking derivatives of a polynomial, right? The degree of that polynomial reduces. The degree of our delta queries will reduce. And eventually, this gives us a guarantee that, that the degree will reach zero, and uh, that's when query compilation will terminate. Okay? Just to uh, give you a sketch of that. So this is the full program that we would have come out um, from uh, the example that we went through. Sorry, I, I started using Qs instead of Ms. But so we did the compilation for Q, and then we did the compilation for, uh, for M, and then for ML. And this was the other way around. We did have a compilation of uh, and with respect to orders and, and so forth. So you end up with uh, this very simple data structure update program. Okay? Now, um, obviously, you know, this notion of uh, going through all possible com uh, permutations of, of relations means that you end up with bigger programs. And we have actually an algorithm that can deal with that um, that I would take offline. It's based on tree decompositions. So when you have things like cyclic query join graphs, which are complicated. Um, we'll still terminate, but you'll get a very large number of orders. We can actually simplify that down and try and uh, uh, reduce the size of this, this kind of program that we have. Okay. Um, I just want to mention one thing briefly. Um, and that is, so at a high level, this is sort of the delta rewrite rules that we have. And these are actually, a lot of these are taken for standard incremental view maintenance. For example, the delta of a, of a oops, going the wrong way, of a Join is simply um, you push the join down each branch as well as taking the delta down two branches. Okay, plus and times here are union and, and, and uh, natural join. The interesting case is when you really have uh, what's the delta of a predicate, okay? And in particular, in our uh, framework, what we like to take care of is handling uh, the predicate here it can be a nested aggregate query. We can have a sum aggregation down here. Now, the reason why the predicate is interesting is because if you look at all these other rules, 
they all end up as simpler terms. The delta is sort of well-defined, and there's the original uh, expression. It's always guaranteed to be simpler than the original expression. That is not the case in a nested query. In particular, t plus delta t is exactly the new value. Yeah? So the point here is that in a nested query, you're not guaranteed to be simpler, um, except, uh, except for uh, being simpler down one of the branches. So we had to we had to deal with that in order to ensure this termination property of of, uh, of having the degree always reduced by one. Um, the, only, the other sort of interesting thing here is a couple other points I want to make. Um, our query language is actually closed under Delta Transform, so all these queries are just regular parameterized SQL queries. They're no, no different than anything else. And ex with the exception of these rules that are here, I mean, these symbols are just delta symbols. So it doesn't really matter if you have a delta of a single tuple or of a batch for a whole bunch of tuples. Okay? And that turns out to be interesting later on. Okay. Um, so I, I want to just uh, give you a rough idea of, of where we're going uh, with all this. So we're building this uh, compilation framework. And what I've really shown you is, is at a high level, um, a couple of these stages. And that's really this. Uh, this core part here of rewrite simplification and materialization and, and sort of going through that in a recursive fashion. There's a couple of other things um, that we have to deal with, um, and I just wanted to mention uh, one thing, a um, couple things. What is the sort of internal forms of the queries that we're using? As it turns out, one of the, uh, one of the forms that we're using are these sort of uh, polynomial queries, and what I mean by that is uh, internally our queries are essentially these uh, sums of products. And this is very much related to things like generalized distributivity law, which is what we're really getting, the kind of simplification we're getting out of here. Um, so this polynomial form simply means that you're going to have joins of, uh, uh, of sub-queries, and also then you're going to you know, just union them up. And once we have this, the precise um, statement of how our queries become simpler is that we can take our input query and flatten that into this polynomial form. Um, one of the term, one of the monomials, one of the uh, elements inside the sum is always going to get simpler. Okay? And that's exactly how we know that um, uh, the query will eventually terminate. I'm, I'm not going to mention about the nested added form. Okay. Um, and any questions at that point? Otherwise, we'll sort of move on to a, a different part of the talk. Okay, good. Um, so there's, you know, at a very high level, I've just given you one way of evaluating these queries. There's a lot of issues that we still have to work out in terms of how to precisely do this. Um, one is the materialization strategy. So we're actually materializing a lot of data structures here, right? If we consider uh, all possible combinations of various joint, of various uh, uh, update orders. We can certainly reduce that. We can design an op We're currently working on a cost-based optimization algorithm that will pick up exactly which data structures it makes sense to materialize. And we can also do other things like uh, uh, easier, e lazy versus eager evaluation. We don't need to do this insert on every tuple that we see, but if we do it over a small batch, we can do some optimizations there. Um, the other uh, sort of interesting thing that we want to consider, yeah. Yeah. You don't have to. So that, that so what you can do is you can rerun the query from scratch, just like standing. In, in, you can you can say I want to materialize some part of that tree, and for the parts that aren't materialized, they're just standard queries that you're going to evaluate in, in usual form. So that way you don't have you know you can actually play with how much memory your data structures take up versus how much work you redo. Okay, that's the high level idea. You can you can materialize and take a tree. You can materialize absolutely any any subset of that graph. If you materialize nothing, you're just doing standard query evaluation. Right. The difference between lazy eager is, is is the following, right? So right now the programs that we have are as follows. Um, for every uh, element that we see, we're going and evaluating this immediately. It's eager evaluation, right? Every time we see an update, we do it. We can actually defer it. We can batch things up. We can do further optimizations in terms of how much batching you want to do and so forth. And also, there, there's a space. So right now, what I, there, there's a space there. There's fully batch computation or standard query processing versus fully incremental. And I just want to say that there's a lot of options in between. It's not just at these two spectrums. Okay. okay. 
So, but what I want to talk about is um, parallelism, right? Uh, and in particular, uh, the other sort of semantics here is that whenever you see an, up, uh, an insert or an update, you have to evaluate this entire uh, program from top to bottom because uh, you need to make sure that you maintain, in this case, QO so that QO can be used here reasonably. There, there is this sort of uh, in standard view materialization, you have this notion of a state crank, right? You always want to make sure that the new value depends on the old value, right? You don't want to do intermix things like a new value depends on the new value. Uh, that can complicate the kind of program that you have. Okay? But in our case, we always have the new value dependent on the old value, and so we have to maintain all of these data structures as in an atomic fashion. Now, um, okay, so that's exactly what we want to try and scale up, right? And so part of, as part of ongoing work, one of the systems that we're building is this uh, uh, large-scale um, uh, parallel processing based on doing incremental streaming uh, computation. Um, and so it turns out that actually these trigger programs that we have are embarrassingly parallel. And this comes from the fact that uh, if you look at what our programs are, we have these loops, right? So when I was showing you this guy, this guy was actually a looping statement because S prior wasn't in here. So these loops can actually you know, be parallelized quite nicely. Um, and it turns out that a subset for a certain class of queries, um, no nesting and no equi joins, we can have NC0 uh, parallel complexity, okay? Um, and they essentially have this uh, atomicity requirement that the new state depends on the prior state. And so the prior state must be made consistent um, as part of it. So I mentioned this sort of naive approach of doing serial processing. The other approach is to exploit the fact that we're really doing, uh, we have deltas here. So we can do some sort of out, out of order processing. And let me try and explain this a little bit. So given a trigger where we have statements of this form, um, there's sort of two kinds of parallelism. One is obviously within the loops we've mentioned here, but also um, across different um, invocations. So the first insertion had the values one, two, three, four. The second insertion had five, six, seven, eight. We could try and parallelize them, but there is this consistency requirement that we have to meet. Yeah? Right. So what can we do? Well, at a high level, and I don't want to go into too much detail, um, one thing that we could do is begin to use approaches like multi-version concurrency control. And essentially what we have is this version data structure, which contains a, a few parts. There's a read log and a write log. And so what we could do here is that by keeping track of versions, our, our, the entries in these logs are all increments, okay? So we can compute the increments, and the increments sort of depend on each other. At the very least of our sort of query, our, our increments only depend on the update you see on the screen. So we can actually sort of build a system that sort of propagates these updates in these versions in this manner to actually compute the query result. Um, and so what this lets us do is that uh, the individual machines and starters don't need to be very tightly synchronized. They can actually sort of be uh, slightly more loosely synchronized, and we'll actually achieve a, a, a sort of hybrid consistency model out of this uh, approach. Um, what the hybrid consistency model means is as follows. Um, you can ask for uh, query results at any point in time and get an inaccurate result just by looking at the tail log. If you want a properly consistent result, you can do this periodically by compacting all of the entries in the log into the actual update that you have, okay? And that will give you a correct answer. So we have this mode of the question is then how, how frequently do you do this log compaction, right? How frequently do you bring things up to date? And that's what uh, uh, affects the efficiency of this process. Okay. Um, and there's sort of one more uh, part that I uh, want to talk about, and that's as follows. So uh, the thing that we didn't talk about is I really left out this trick construction, this low-level sort of evaluation of these queries. Okay, um, so I described our pro trigger programs as statements of uh, map updates, where the right-hand side of that map update was just a regular SQL query, parameter SQL query. So we're looking at, since we're building a compiler, what we'd actually like to try and do is think about how do other communities build compilers, right? How do PL and compiler folks, you know, what kinds of optimizations do they do? What kind of transformations do they do? And what can we take from there? So what we're actually in the process of doing is designing a, a simple functional language for expressing these lower level uh, compilation plans. Um, and so it can actually, the kind of language we're describing can uh, capture a lot of transformations about the physical aspects of query processing, whether you use pipelines or block evaluation um, and uh, quite a few other things. 
uh, our language design around, it's called K3, it's, which is inspired by Kleisley and K2. This is uh, sort of work done at uh, Pennsylvania by Peter Binneman in the day. And uh, the idea is that the functional primitives are essentially lets us operate on nested collections. And you can show that these uh, primitives uh, essentially form a monad, do monadic transforms. Um, and this is sort of the work that's also very much been looked at by uh, the functional programming community in thinking about language embedded queries, this link and ferry and so forth. So uh, at a very high level, um, the primitives that we have here are the functional map, flat and aggregate. Um, and in addition, our core language right now, in addition to these primitives, has one thing. It has the ability to sort of lay, to define persistent data structures. Let's sort of look at an example of what this uh, is. So suppose we're given a, a simple uh, join aggregate query again, like we have that will appear on the right-hand side uh, of our sugar programs. Um, what we end up with is, is as follows. So this query will be implemented as follows. So let's sort of do work bottom up, right? So when we're doing R join S, what we're doing is we're, in this case, S on the left-hand side. So we're going to iterate over S and create a tuple A. Then we're going to sort of, for every R value that we have, we're going to apply this map function. So that's the join essentially becomes a map of a map. Yep, it's fairly straightforward. Yes. So if I'm yes. Uh, no, it's so it's not a join. It's actually a cross product here, right? There's no common variable. Yeah. Just in, this is just an example, right? But just to show you that if you had um, a uh, a join, you'd have an equality predicate inside here that says if the two are equal, then produce a tuple or not. For, okay, if we had, for example, if we had RAB and SBC, we would have inside here does you know, R.B equals S.B, right? Inside one of these functions. It's also a fairly simple in code. So uh, what is interesting here in this representation though, right? I mean, think about what uh, a query process are doing. Um, for every operation, they take, an opera they take two input relations and they produce an output relation. So in essence, that's sort of why we have this flatten operation here. Right, we're, we're, we're flattening uh, this sort of a, a, a nested data structure that we have out to preserve um, you know, various normal forms. And so this appears again here, once we have here, and all the way forward. Another way of writing this, if we apply sort of uh, standard transformations, is as follows, okay? Um, so what does this look like, right? This is actually just a three-way nested loops join, right? It's a multi-way join operation. And we've lifted the flattens out and essentially composed all the maps together. So, um, all right, pop quiz. What, what's the advantage? Why do I call this optimized? What's the advantage of doing this over that approach? Does anyone have a intuition? So, you notice that this isn't a join. This is really a product. So, in general, for high selectivity operations, what you're going to end up here is you're going to create these intermediate results, which really you don't want around whatsoever, right? it's going to be essentially a full product. So in this case, what we can do is a fully pipeline solution that really says, I'm going to, as I'm doing this uh, through a join, I'm going to pipeline it directly into the aggregation and do uh, the aggregate incrementally. So there's an interesting space of plans that actually turns out from here. Um, and what we generally have with this framework is, is an ability to mix things like tuple at a time processing, set at a time processing. Um, we can sort of eliminate temporaries much in the same way that supercompilers or deforestation techniques on functional programs do the same thing. Um, and uh, in fact, what I'd also like to explore is, you know, what are good strategies for using nested forms internally within these query plans? You can vectorize processing. You can do a lot of other things. So it's not going to drop map until Yes, it is. Um, I could. I just, uh, I want to explicitly control the difference between X, between flat and map. Yeah, there are certain optimizations that need to do it that way. In, not not in terms of the re, not in terms of expressiveness, but in terms of how they map down into the hardware. I mean, Undo, right? Yeah. But in some cases, you could actually exploit that nested structure um, in in terms of uh, vectorized processing. You vectorize a bunch of a bun bunch of updates in one go, and only the nested part, and you just sort of push that up. So there's things that we can do there. Um, okay, and just to sort of wrap up, again, um, 
what I want to show is, is the following, right? So what we started off with was these simple trigger programs. Uh, I, I want to show you, what are we doing with K3? What I actually want to do with K3 is use it as a way of getting architectural flexibility. I did, you know, rather than sort of uh, developing these sort of very rigid systems, I want to be able to control where you do processing, whether it's a query time, update time, and I want sort of a programmatic way of describing exactly the work that's going on in the database. So I started off with um, the trigger program that says, let's update a data structure, and let's say it's some K3 expression, right? We saw these trigger programs, and I said, these are just simple queries that we can represent in K3. Now, you know, if we look at a lot of work that's being done, queries and updates you know, aren't just simple query plans. They have a lot of side effects on the internal database state, okay? And there's no well-accepted way of describing all of the work that's uh, getting done. Many of these turned out to be data um, structure manipulations. You can think of index maintenance. You can insert to an index. You can do, say, database cracking, which means you know, uh, do use partial indexes and so forth. So many of these things are data structure operations. So what I'm designing, trying to design K3 as is so just a general dynamic language for a view-based program, right, um, which describes data dependencies, data movement, and so forth. There's a couple of extensions. I'll talk about one. Uh, I want to design it to be a language that is actually pretty easy to translate down into low-level physical uh, hardware. Um, oops, sorry, I'm gonna. And I'll talk about so, uh, one example of this in a second. Um, and the uh, goal here is to represent all the computation that gets done in the database during the processing. So for example, you know, what really goes on in an OLTP system, right? Whenever you're uh, inserting a piece of data, what you have is you're also appending to the log record, right? For checkpointing and, and recovery. You're also doing things like maintaining indices. And really, these are just, again, simple data structure operations. So, and so I, I've talked about trigger programs. What if you had a query that you wanted to compile? You can also just directly represent the work that that query needs to do uh, as, as some operations like this. So that's what we want to, we want to enrich the role of the compiler in the, in the database management system. So I, I, I want to just uh, explain one thing. I'll give you an example of what is this kind of physical level um, uh, uh, advantages you can get with our kind of programs. So let's go back to this three-way uh, cross-product operation and we write it down as a flat and map map. Um, what it turns out is that we can actually, for example, do adapt to storage and, and achieve flexible data organization. So suppose we have this map here. We had a map SCD and for now I've just been saying this is an in-memory data structure that you're gonna run through this program as follows. It turns out we can actually do things like uh, annotate it and with that annotation, control what the layout is. So suppose I just said this is a, a disk segment of the program, which describes how this map is going to be physically stored on disk. Um, turns out that's actually just a sort of K3 program in itself, right? What is this program saying? Um, well, it's two things. So it's a map of a map, so there's some nested structure to this disk layout. In fact, the, the relation S has been sort of decomposed into two parts, the CD part and the E part. So the E part only has the E attribute. So for each value of E, we're gonna store and lay out the entire uh, values of C and D for that map. So we can come up and we can control and play with what the layout and representation here is to come up with a bunch of different ways of doing this. And in general, there's actually a spectrum between things like column, or in column layouts, row layouts, and uh, a sort of more block-based layouts. But we can programmatically represent them and actually manipulate them in exactly the same way that we're doing transforms and rewrites of our programs. There's no reason why we can't change that with the same sort of rules. So we have a much sort of hopefully simpler uh, internal infrastructure that we can uh, use here. Okay, um, and just to give you another example, so that was a uh, as this example just shows the difference between. Um, denormalization and, and uh, nested layouts. This is an example of a, of a denormalized layout. And what you'll see here is we have an additional attribute X, and X is really the position of a tuple. So how does a column store work? Yeah, um, given a row, you can decompose columns, but you have to keep track of which positions each uh, individual tuple corresponds to. And you can do that through something like an attribute X. So there's, just to show you, there's quite a lot of flexibility here. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, between this version and the next version? Yeah. Um, so here, there, there is actually, this is a nested layout. There is no uh, position attribute whatsoever, right? Um, so 
in this sense, when you're physically writing it out to disk, it's within a single uh, tuple page block that you control that structure. Here, you can, so you can't really actually decouple these two things here. They're still sort of nested inside each other. In this, oops, in this example, you can actually decouple them and lay them out on arbitrary parts of the disk because you, you're explicitly representing the linkage between the different parts of the row with this uh, X attribute. Um, it, it's you, the way you actually sort of read the program, right? So in this sense, it is this part here, right? You're actually creating this tuple, E, C, D. E is, uh, there's this map here would actually be a, a collection data structure, right? It will be um, a layout of this collection on the memory or disk. But the fact that it's, an, it's a nested map, that's what means that they're clustered. This syntax is not final or anything. I mean, it could clearly be uh, revised a little, but yes. That, that, at a high level, that's a distinction I want to make between these two kinds of programs, and maybe it doesn't come out in this example. Okay. So, um, just to sort of wrap up, I, I'd imagine. So, we've, we've motivated this work by looking at uh, these applications that work with large evolving data sets. We're saying we want to sort of rethink how we can build database systems to try and handle these kinds of classes. And so there's sort of three high-level takeaways I want to give from this. One is this sort of notion of in as incrementally as possible uh, computation with this recursive delta compilation, delta materialization, that we can obviously trade off the space versus the amount of incremental computation you do. Um, the other thing I wanted to briefly talk, talk about was um, this notion of rethinking how we express database internals, not just as these operator-based uh, query graphs, but I think we need a slightly richer representation there. Um, for example, what I was looking at was a language that makes tuple of time versus set of time crossing, but it turns out I think we can go a little further than that and actually sort of capture other aspects of the uh, other. And the last aspect was this notion of doing, uh, uh, building eventually consistent distributed systems by using uh, the incremental properties of updates. Yeah. So I will, at this point, take any questions. Um, I appreciate it. <laughs> Please keep coming with the questions. It's a lot of fun. Um, how can we go? Okay, it's going to be quicker. Can I sort of control it there? Uh, yeah, can we, is there a way of getting around? Okay, go all the way down. Stop. Maybe, hey, maybe I'll end it there. Um, so here's why I sort of didn't show results uh, on the slide deck. So I mentioned where version four of our compiler. Um, this is the results from version two. <laughs> and so in some sense, uh, there's we're kind of actually, there are some advantages that we're coming to in our back and some of the data structures we use um, that we'll show here that won't come up in this uh, slide. Okay. So let me sort of briefly explain what's going on. We did this experiment. Um, uh, it's an experiment that shows what the processing time achieved by our algorithm, dbtoaster, is compared to both view maintenance as well as repetitive processing. So every time you get an update, you just run the query from scratch. Yeah, that's what naive processing is. We use two kinds of uh, data sets. First is this financial data set, which is an order book, but the second is also simulating changes to TPCH data sources. Okay? Um, and what we're seeing here on the y-axis is a, a, a log scale notion of how the processing time is. And the high level take here is that we actually sort of do a lot better uh, in general. Um, in particular, I mean, we're talking a couple of orders of magnitude. Um, but this is with a fully materialized everything there. So you can actually ask what the memory layout is, and I have another slide for that. Yeah. Yeah. It, there's no parallelism here whatsoever. Um, and so just to sort of, uh, so this is, Right, so these were with our own implementation of this, and we repeated the same thing with actually the commercial database system. Um, we saw a similar performance difference. I just wanted to show you the memory layout. Um, so the memory is very much dependent on the kinds of queries and the kinds of data you have, right? So one factor it does depend on is the number of distinct values that you see in a particular attribute, okay? And so what you can see is that for certain attributes, you really don't see that many distinct values. These are the finance queries. So, um, I. I, won't, I can show you what the queries actually are if you'd like. But in, in essence, you don't see that many distinct values, and it tails off. 
And why is this? Well, in the financial uh, order books, um, they have a granularity of 100 units of uh, in terms of the price or the volume, right? And so you don't actually get to see a fully continuous you know, uh, 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 data domain there. Um, whereas in the other, so the reason why this comes up is actually to do with nested queries, and I'm, I'm not going to go too much into that. Um, but overall, um, on the order books, we're pretty small. This was for one order from Microsoft over the entire day, um, and we can accumulate all that, and it only comes up to a few uh, uh, you know, uh, Megabytes. Um, whereas in this case, this is a one a scale factor one TPCH data set, but also we see similar trends where in some queries it does actually bound off, but in some queries it's going to be on top. Yes. Um, they're, they're, the only the interesting aspect of deletions is that um, so our, our, our model is that um, you can think of uh, multi sets as uh, counts of tuples. Okay. And deletions are simply modeled as negative counts. Um, but we also have to have a specific way of handling that in the deltas, which is this minus operation in the delta. It's, it's not set delete. It really is multi-set delete, which means you delete, de decrement the counts. Yeah. Um, so. Oh, OK, yeah, yeah. so here's, a, here's a, some answers to that. Um, Mins and max are asymmetric deltas in the sense that um, on the insertions, mins and max are just your standard, you know, uh, uh, they have similar properties to some. Uh, on deletions, it becomes very much like this top K on the issue, right? There's a sorted order and you have, if you remove the top one, you have to go and figure that out, right? Um, so what this means is that you have to keep around the full state. You can't keep around a very small piece of state for the handling uh, deletions, but we can do it with a, with a customized delta transform rule, okay? We keep an extra a data structure around to track the full, that, that uh, sort of it, and then we can manipulate that in place. The other interesting question is what's the delta of a sort function, okay? Um, which is what we're get, kind of getting to here. And I have some thoughts on that. Um, in, in, this, in essence, what we have is that, just like we had with this sort of uh, positional, what a sort function gives you is that it gives you the query result as well as uh, an extra attribute that consists of what a position's values is. So whenever you change something on the inner query, you're also going to change the corresponding position. And we can write this up, okay, as a delta function as well. Um, we haven't sort of fully finished that in any shape or form, but in essence, by encoding the deltas of positions, we can actually begin to work with some of the sorting uh, algorithms and try and do something general. What if, what if you want to start with the position of the delta? Yes. <laughs> so uh, basically, yeah. So I started this talk talking about large data sets, and so far I've mostly been talking about main memory eh? um, systems. Um, so the, the answer there is as follows. Uh, we actually want to come up with some interesting ways of designing data structures and so forth to deal with this. In particular, things I mentioned, things like partial indices and central. You don't need to materialize the full view itself. You can materialize only a few entries of these views. And based on that, you can essentially think of paging out um, some of these entries onto disk in an intelligent manner. And what you really want to do is only keep the things that are really frequently changed in memory. That's a general policy that hasn't changed in, in a lot of these systems, the way they work. But we'd like to exploit how you can perhaps do interesting layout structures. Um, so we have this multi-level um, uh, multi level uh, set of deltas. You can actually lay it out on disk in terms of that sort of delta pattern as well, and that will get you uh, much more efficient access. The high level point is whenever you have an update, it doesn't change the entire database state, but it doesn't just change one tuple either. It changes some fragment of that. And you have to sort of try and identify and separate out in a clean way what these fragments are and how they correspond to updates to get to uh, efficient performance on this. So, uh, can we go back one slide? Yes. So, um, this one or this one? Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, absolutely, and so, but this comes back to this question of what, what are we really achieving here with incremental processing compared to this batch processing that classical systems, I, I'm calling it batch, right? Um, and so that, that's absolutely an area of work that we want to do. Um, and 
we could so there's certain optimizations that you can do once you begin to consider things in larger blocks than just single tuples. There's also certain things you can't do um, when you consider things as larger blocks. So we can actually play with the spectrum of what's the granularity at which we're doing this operation. And that's partly what I wanted to do with these nested data structures. You can tweak the granularity uh, a lot and, and sort of begin to uh, play with it as well. The other thing I will say is, um, so the queries I've also shown you are sort of Fairly nice queries. If you so, in the sense that if you take equijoins and some aggregations over them, uh, there there's this issue of um, actually. Can I? Can we go back to one of? All right. So yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna do this. Just how many queries exactly? Um, so one thing that takes a while to figure out is, so here what we're doing is whenever we're updating the M database, we're updating, we're taking it from MC with some parameters, right? Um, what if that entry doesn't exist in the database? You could get a new value of CK that you've never seen before. This is, we call this initial value prob uh, problem. And so in general, with these kinds of equijoin aggregate queries, initial values are always zero, okay? When you have inequalities, the initial value might not be zero, and you have to go and compute that there and then. You have to do a, a query from scratch to get what that value of this uh, data structure is. Um, and so the general initial value problem is also something that's related to just that when you mention initialization, um, that comes up. Um, yeah, most of what I've talked about says that you work incrementally from scratch, but if you start in a, in doing incremental operation in an arbitrary point, you have to deal with doing um, whole query evaluation mixed in with this delta uh, approaches. Yeah, <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. Um, yeah, there's other sort of kinds of join operations that we have to consider. Um, but I, yeah, most of these, the way we'd approach them is encoding them in terms of understanding their input and output variable structure and how does this sort of variable domains uh, come together dealing with things like average ones. Um, the other sort of uh, aspect of this that I haven't really talked about, nulls, handling nulls. Um, one point where this has come up in just from an experience story. Um, so we always took things like, uh, what was it? Um, sum of one to be the same as count. In SQL, that's absolutely not the case, right? If sum of one will always return you zero. Sorry, sum of one can return you null on an empty database, whereas count will always return you zero. Okay, <laughs> so in general, there's actually these a lot of subtleties going on with where nulls can occur in the SQL standard compared to how this corresponds down. But um, uh, we can exploit nulls in, in certain ways to do filtering and to throw away nulls early in terms of maintaining aggregates that I haven't gone into. Can you explain just a little bit more So I think we can exploit, I mean, if we have patterns and updates, I think we're going to exploit. So I mean, the kinds of programs that we're generating are for a, a, a single update of any arbitrary value. We can actually exploit and encode that pattern directly into the program. We're really doing program specialization here, right? For, for a particular query, come up with a way of compiling this that's really optimizing to use for just this, this particular operation. We can absolutely apply the same technique to sort of small batches and groups that we're talking about if we know what the relationship between those groups are. Yes, so in essence, what we have here is the uh, every query is simply iterate over uh, the relation you took the delta on and uh, and combine it with that delta query. So in, in that sense, um, it, when you say update query, I assume you mean the delta query, right? 
make it be a simple example. What you can do is, right, suppose we've already done this, you can stitch together all that stuff and then look for optimization. That's a very naive way of doing this. Yeah? What we can actually do is, again, if you know exactly that pattern, is it use it while you're doing the delta transform to come up with a different update statement or, or a data structure update statement. And again, essentially specialize the program that you're running to that particular query. That's, that's absolutely reasonable. This comes back to this point that I was making that the deltas that we have in our delta transforms are just symbols. It's not that they have to be a particular tuple. They can be a batch. They can be have some other properties around it um, that we can exploit. This is also related to, for example, uh, take the case of you having certain integrity constraints on your um, database. You know that one tuple will be inserted, must be present in a relation before it can be manipulated from the other. You can exploit things like integrity constraints as additional constraints you can add during query optimization to even further specialize the stack. Yeah, um, okay. So, I think it's fairly close to here. Okay. Uh, so here, here's the rough idea, right? So what we're really going to do is you can imagine taking these map data structures and doing horizontal partitioning on them, right? That's a very sort of simplistic way of doing that. So we can build a, a main memory sort of a, a large share of power and processing by distributing the map data structures throughout a bunch of different machines. Now, what we'll have is that, um, so we have this thing called an update switch. As we get updates coming in from, say, your OLTP databases, this update switch has to sort of figure out how to evaluate that, that statement that we had using the combination of these of these uh, uh, shards, in some sense, of the map, okay? So this switch is essentially a coordinator. What it will do is it will generate a, uh, we can also compile this down, generate a set of messages that correspond to fetch me data from this map, send it to another node, which has some other part of the map, do the computation there, and forward it on. What we have is a, is a fully asynchronous protocol to do this. There is sort of, uh, based on the fact that we're, we only have deltas that we're just sort of pushing and forwarding onto other nodes. So there is no um, coordination, there is no sort of blocking property. So let me give you an example, right? Suppose you had uh, some part of the map that you needed to read from these values. A simple protocol would go ahead and read these uh, uh, entries and then send it to another node and, uh, and do that. And then, then this node would block until it had data from all those nodes. It doesn't need to. Yeah, yeah. So it's that's just it's just a coordinator. It's like your you know scheduler in your in MapReduce. It doesn't actually involve in data blocks. Okay. Um, so what I wanted to make the point was that if you're going to do a bunch of reads, you have to wait until you get all that data at this particular node to do some computation. We can remove that blocking point. When we designed the first version of the system, um, we essentially found that this sort of blocking synchronization point, this is very heavyweight. It kills the total number of sort of uh, amount of data you can get through. Um, what we can instead do is, this is sort of, I, I really did skip over this, but this was the point of these log-based data structures. You just simply forward the data uh, and it gets entered into a log. And again, you only need to quiesce and compact that data to consistency whenever you have all that data. It's not like you need to block, you keep doing uh, work in pipeline fashion for the remainder of the data that's coming in, but only when you have all the data, you can go ahead and produce a consistent result. Anything in between is gonna be inconsistent. Sorry, yeah. So, uh, can the multiple tuples be Okay, yeah. So the first version of the switch we wrote was we relied on TCP ordering to say that we have an ordered input stream so it doesn't happen. The second version we wrote is a distributed switch. So it runs over multiple machines which can give you out of order. But that's exactly what um, this uh, data structure gives you, this log, log data structure. So what happens is that in this period between when you have a consistent point in log and you have a bunch of uh, deltas that come along, you have the opportunity to do reordering. So the compaction period that we have is exactly what we need to do the reordering to make sure that we solve uh, 
uh, these out of order problems. That's why it's, it's sort of it's bounded out of order. And I can sort of draw an example on a whiteboard and I have a bunch of uh, slides to do this. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And so the, the trade off there is how much system state do you keep with the size of these logs versus how frequently, how, you know, quickly do you need to bring it to consistency? Yes. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>